Good evening and welcome. My name is Thomas Poon and I am the Executive Vice President and Provost for Loyola Marymount University. And I'm pleased to introduce Father Alan Deck of the Society of Jesus to deliver the invocation. We invoke your loving presence, Lord, on our gathering this evening in honor of Jose Horacio Gomez, our Archbishop and Shepherd of our community of faith and life. You sent him to us as a servant leader and as an immigrant from Mexico to teach and inspire us with a love for Jesus Christ, your incarnate Son, and for his gospel of justice and peace. We ask your blessings upon this special coming together to honor Archbishop for his gentle and persistent leadership in matters that pertain to the greater good, spiritual and material, of Los Angeles and beyond. May his tenure with us continue for many years to come, and may it be marked by greater solidarity among all peoples. May he find encouragement and comfort in the honor to be conferred upon him this evening. Finally, we ask your blessing, loving Lord, on the conversation we will have on Catholic higher education, particularly at Loyola Marymount University, on this university's exciting mission and identity as a major Catholic university in the Jesuit and Marymount traditions, and on its promise, possibilities, and challenges at these times of epical change. Amen. Thank you, Father Deck. I'm pleased to recognize Chair Viviano and LMU trustees, President Snyder, Archbishop Gomez, LMU regents, members of LMU's religious community, LMU leadership, faculty, staff, alumni, students, and other distinguished guests. Thank you for being with us this evening, and thank you for supporting Loyola Marymount University. I'm honored by your presence, and I am happy you are joining us for today's celebration. This is a special occasion as we will present the Most Reverend Jose H. Gomez, Archbishop of Los Angeles with an honorary degree. I'm pleased to invite Paul Viviano, Chair of LMU's Board of Trustees, to deliver the citation. Loyola Marymount University bestows honorary degrees on persons who symbolize in an outstanding manner those values it cherishes as an academic community. In honoring these persons, the university acknowledges that the life and the work of an honoree mirrors our goal, including the search for the authentic meaning and truth of human life. Today, the university is proud to honor Archbishop Jose Gomez, an individual whose life achievements very much reflect the mission of this great university. Timothy Law Snyder, president of Loyola Marymount University, will introduce the recipient of the honorary degree. Good evening. I am honored to join Reverend Alan Deck of the Society of Jesus. Thank you, Father Deck. Faculty Senate President William Parham, Executive Vice President and Provost Thomas Poon, and Chair of our Board of Trustees Paul Viviano in welcoming Archbishop Gomez back to, and certainly for a wonderful occasion, Loyola Marymount University. 
We welcome the Honorable Anthony L. Coelho, who's with us this evening. We honor the members of our Board of Trustees, including the Honorable Irma Brown, Ms. Kathleen Duncan, Ms. Christy Fry, Sister Mary Beth Engham, CSJ, Mr. Joseph Knott, Mr. Stephen Page, and Sister Joan Tracy, RSHM. We welcome members of our Board of Regents, including Chair Maria Salinas, Mr. David Herbst, and Mr. Joseph Page. We welcome our former Chair of the Board of Trustees, Ms. Kathleen Hannon Aikenhead, and Mr. David Aikenhead, back to LMU. We welcome our faculty, we welcome our students, including ASLMU President Hayden Tanabe. Hayden, where are you? He's always in the front. I don't know how he manages that. We welcome our staff, and we welcome all our LMU friends and neighbors. We welcome Telemundo. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have with us two extraordinary students, and these are the first ever recipients of the Archbishop Jose H. Gomez Catholic Association of Latino Leaders Scholarship. Mr. Andrew Gonzalez, a senior political science major, and Ms. Gabriela Gonzalez, a first year engineering major. Could you please stand? Congratulations. I thank our co-sponsors for tonight's presentation, the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination and University Relations. So thank you, Professor Brian Trainer. Thank you, Senior Vice President Dennis Sloan. And thank you for all who made this glorious evening possible. Tonight, I am privileged to bestow LMU's highest honor upon a courageous, and compassionate man of God, the most reverend, Jose H. Gomez, the Archbishop of the nation's largest, the nation's most diverse Catholic community. Anyone who has had the opportunity to speak with Archbishop Gomez, or even hear him speak, has been warmed by his heart, has been heartened by his warm demeanor. He encourages us to follow Jesus Christ and do so with the simplicity and joy of life. And he asks that we serve God and our neighbors in our daily activities. Through our Jesuit lens, that means finding God in all things. And certainly all things include all people as well as each of us. As the Vice President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, Archbishop Gomez seeks to challenge our consciences to inspire us to action, to love our neighbor, and to perform works of mercy. Indeed, Archbishop Gomez is a voice of compassion, a voice of reason on moral and spiritual issues in American life and culture. He plays a leading role in the Catholic Church's efforts to promote immigration reform. He is a steadfast and vocal proponent for the DACA program and our dreamers. As a nation, he wrote, we have a moral and humanitarian obligation to the dreamers in this great state of the Union, California. That was supposed to be a pun. <laughs> Archbishop Gomez's writings, his homilies, his speeches, his presence inspire us to do better, to act and to love with all our being. His is a much needed voice in our society, particularly as we see ourselves increasingly divided and increasingly marginalizing ourselves from the love of our creator. His heart knows no borders. His transformative leadership impacts the Catholic 
community of our city of angels and beyond. Akin to Our Lady of Guadalupe, who I know is dear to Archbishop Gomez, as, as is so for so many of our members of our Latina, Latino community, he shares with each of us the gift of strength, the beautiful, glorious, and boundless gift of strength. You can see his speeches on YouTube about La Virgen, um, Lady Guadalupe, and in his talk, his YouTube talk, which is quite the joy to, to view, the Archbishop asks us to build a shrine with our lives. And with our Catholic faith, he encourages us to see the world with new eyes as we defend the weak and we defend the vulnerable. This is in step with all we seek to do at LMU, all we do when we are at our best. It is symbiotic with the values that we cherish. Now, speaking of values and speaking of success, I don't know if you've heard, but the December report from the Education Trust ranked LMU third in the nation in promoting Latino, Latina student success. And that includes graduation rates. So really and this only happens when the staff, the faculty, the administration, and the students work together harmoniously, understanding that what happens when we put our minds and experiences together, coming from diverse backgrounds, diverse origins, is always greater than any of us could contribute as individuals. This is the essence of what the Archbishop is trying to get to our world. And this is why we continue to seek to build on successes like those. Thank you, Archbishop Gomez, for your leadership your partnership, your spiritual guidance, and your eternal, bountiful friendship. I am honored to invite you to join us on, actually, center stage. Now the Archbishop knows how poorly designed academic year is. <laughs> I like to tell the students, and this is largely to keep them in the audience before the commencement exercises have ceased, that they still don't have their degrees yet until we, until we read the following. This is the conferral. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the laws of the state of California and by the trustees of Loyola Marymount University, I now confer on Most Reverend Jose H. Gomez, Archbishop of Los Angeles, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining to that degree. Congratulations, Archbishop Gomez. I am honored to introduce the newest member of the LMU Lion family, Archbishop Dr. Jose Gomez.
Thank you very much. I have to say that this is worse than the uh, bishops. <laughs> I thought that that was the worst, but this is even more challenging. Uh, my dear friends, I am uh, honored and humble, and humble. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm grateful to President Snyder and to the whole Loyola community for your kindness in welcoming me and for granting me the honoris causa degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Education was always very important in my family. I grew up in Monterrey, Mexico. My father was a medical doctor. Uh, my mother was uh, raised in San uh, My father was uh, born and raised in Monterrey, Mexico. And my mother was raised in San Antonio, Texas. And she also went to college, which was not very common for women in the 1930s. My parents used to always say that the best thing they could ever do for my sisters and I was to give us an education. I always be grateful to my parents for the gifts of my education. Higher education is such a privilege. It is not only about getting training for a specific field. Higher education is about truth. For me, Catholic edu higher education is about forming missionaries and disciples, true followers of Jesus Christ, who have the courage, the intelligence, and the holiness to lead and transform our society with love. It is a privilege also for me to take part in your ongoing conversations about the duties and identity of the Catholic University in the 21st century. These are important conversations. So, this is a real honor to me to be with all of you this evening. May God bless all of you who make up this Loyola Marymount family, and may he help you in this beautiful mission of forming young people to build his kingdom. Thank you very much, and go Lions! <laughs>Okay, thanks very much. My name is Brian Trainer. I'm a professor of philosophy uh, in the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts here at LMU. And I'm currently the director of the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, which helped to organize tonight's events along with university relations and uh, in partnership with the Bellarmine Forum of the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, who's uh, our partner in our programming this year at the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination. I've been asked to briefly describe, for those of you who haven't been to some of our events yet, the Academy and its work, and to situate tonight's event in the context of our broader programming. I hope my colleagues will indulge me as I do so, because some of you have been to other events this year where you've heard a similar introduction. However, the profile of tonight's program has brought a number of people to campus who have not attended previous ACTI events, and I want to welcome them to this conversation and to spare a few words about what we're up to here at the Academy. So ACTI, as uh, Father Deck mentioned upstairs, is the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination here at LMU. We undertake or support a variety of different kinds of work, but one focus, a center of gravity as it were, of our work is the attempt to bring together students and faculty from disciplines across the university to engage the Catholic intellectual traditions and to produce scholarly or creative works doing the same and to support them in incorporating the results of these engagements with the broader university culture and community, for example, in their classes. Here are a few points of clarification or in order, I think, to help you understand what we've been up to the past several years at the Academy. First, as we see it in the Academy, Catholic intellectual tradition is not and has never been univocal. Therefore, I tend to speak in terms of Catholic intellectual traditions in the plural. You pick almost any point in church history or doctrine and you'll find multiple competing accounts, perspectives, and interpretations. And therefore, people can participate in ACTI's mission from a variety of perspectives, and we're not asking anyone to endorse any particular manifestation of the Catholic intellectual traditions. Second, these Catholic intellectual traditions are not solely the province of systematic theology and philosophy. They include, among many other possible examples, the arts, history, economics, politics, literature and poetry, music, and the contributions from many of the sciences. So this dialogue that we're involved in includes contributions by people who are not themselves Catholic. You know, as a philosopher, I think here to Aristotle, who's not only not Catholic, but he's pre-Christian, but he's a central 
contributor to the Catholic intellectual tradition as the Catholic intellectual tradition interpreted and absorbed him. Many similar examples could be found in the works of medieval Jewish and Islamic philosophers, as well as myriad other traditions with which Catholicism has been in dialogue over the past two millennia. Rooted in a tradition that seeks to find God in all things and committed to the pursuit of genuine truth, wherever that leads, the scholarly and creative work undertaken at ACTI is in principle open to partnership with all academic disciplines and any scholar committed to pursuing the truth. So it's not something housed just in the College of Liberal Arts, but it's a, a cross-university program here. Finally, engaging the Catholic intellectual tradition means, from the perspective of ACTI, taking them seriously, full stop. One way to engage the Catholic intellectual traditions is to do something like apologetics, to defend the Catholic position as you understand it. But given what I've just said about the Catholic confidence in the honest pursuit of the truth and the history of Catholic encounters with various other traditions, it's clear that there are other ways to engage the Catholic intellectual traditions as well. Clarifying historical ambiguities, creative appropriation of traditional forms, the application of traditional resources to novel or contemporary work, new problems, developing new resources for the Catholic intellectual traditions, and comparative work with other traditions or modes of knowing and understanding, and indeed, questioning the Catholic positions, history, or traditions. As long as such work is undertaken in pursuit of the truth and in the spirit that understands and takes seriously the Catholic intellectual traditions, rather than caricaturing them, it's serious engagement. So what does that look like for us over the past couple of years? Acti's programming tends to focus on a semester or year-long basis on different themes. And this year, working with the Bellman College of Liberal Arts and the Bellman Forum, we've been thinking about the idea of a Catholic university in the 21st century. So a quick word about that to situate tonight's event. 50 years ago, a group of Catholic university administrators joined by new a few faculty got together to discuss the state and future of Catholic universities in the United States. The document they produced is known as the Land O'Lake Statement and includes the following somewhat lengthy quote. The Catholic University today must be a university in the full modern sense of the word, with a strong commitment to and concern for academic excellence. The Catholic University participates in the total university life of our time and has the same functions as all other true universities and in general offers the same service to society. The Catholic University adds to the basic idea of a modern university distinctive characteristics with which, uh, which round out and fulfill that idea. Now this statement, which is only an excerpt from the Land O'Lake Statement, recognized and accelerated a trend in Catholic universities to emulate in various ways prestigious secular schools. But there was almost immediately a pushback. To put it in an idiom that is alive and well at LMU and other Catholic colleges today, if we start to think of Occidental, USC, and similar schools as our comparator or aspirational institutions, that is as models for our emulation here at LMU. What happens to our commitment to the particular vision, Catholic, Jesuit, Marymount, Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, that founded LMU? Now, unlike the climate that immediately preceded the Land of Lakes gathering, the issue today is not academic freedom. Although all universities must remain vigilant about that, and perhaps increasingly so in light of certain social and political pressures. The issue is rather distinctiveness. What makes LMU distinctive vis-a-vis -vis some of the other universities I've mentioned? This is a question that every university that hopes to be special must ask and answer. One might ask the same. What distinguishes Reed or St. John's or Deep Springs from a school like Michigan State? I think all three of those schools could give very clear very detailed answers as to what makes them distinctive vis-a-vis -vis these large state schools. And the question at LMU and at every other Catholic university in the country is how are we distinctive? How can we be both fully, without qualification, prestigious modern universities with all the emphases on universality that that implies, and at the same time be genuinely, authentically Catholic, which seems to apply, imply a commitment towards a specific particularity, a specific tradition? So that's what we've been out to discuss this past year, reflect on it, and temp attempt to articulate it as a community here at LMU. What does it mean to be a university in the 21st century as universities change to adapt to new social realities? What does it mean to be a Catholic university in the 21st century? And what's distinctive about the particular case of LMU? Now, as a member of our community and, and deeply committed to this institution, 
I have my own particular answers to, to those sorts of questions. However, as director of ACTI and of this year's Bellarmine Forum, my goal is not to put forward my own answers as definitive, although they are, <laughs> but, but rather to help our community engage in some reflection and deliberation with the goals of first building a scholarly and intellectual community amongst faculty and students, and two, enlivening a shared conversation that won't end this year, it will just begin this year, about our mission and goals, since at the end of this year, we're not gonna to come to a universally agreed upon document that we all sign on to. As part of this conversation, uh, tonight we're honored, very pleased, honored to welcome to the campus the Most Reverend Jose Gomez, Archbishop of Los Angeles, as part of what we're billing as a moderated conversation with the Archbishop. He'll be joined by Dr. Gene Ortiz, Dean of Students here at LMU, and by Dr. John Sebastian, our Vice President for Mission and Ministry. The Archbishop is going to begin with a brief statement about some issues that are on his mind, which we, as part of a community associated with the Catholic intellectual traditions, are called to reflect on, after which Drs. Ortiz and Sebastian will engage the Archbishop in conversation on a variety of topics. These topics were gathered during the RSVP process for this event, and many of you contributed those questions um, that we've, we've uh, distributed for the discussion. So. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I hope that you uh, are interested enough in what happens tonight that you'll come to other events programmed by ACTI or by the Bellman College of Liberal Arts or by LMU more generally. Thank you for joining us, and please join me in welcoming back to the stage Archbishop Gomez, Dr. Ortiz, and Dr. Sebastian. Uh, good evening to everyone again. Good evening. Um, I have a few uh, remarks. It's, it's always a challenge to give a microphone to a priest. <laughs> <laughs> and it's much worse to give it to an archbishop. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I kind of put together some ideas about uh, this issue that uh, is especially interesting for me these days and for all of us of... Uh, of immigration. So uh, let's see if I can go through it. Um, uh, I try to uh, give a little summary because I guess it's getting late now. Uh, so I, I'm, I know that you all are familiar with the basic principles that guide Catholic thinking about immigration. Uh, I just want to use this time to offer my perspective briefly on the current situation with DACA and immigration reform in Washington. Um, obviously, we, we all know this issue is especially important here in Los Angeles and at colleges and universities across the country. I know that uh, you have dreamers here at LMU, and there are about 125,000 or more living in, in the Los Angeles area, more than anywhere else in the country. So. It is crucial for Congress to act. As we also know, there is a March the 5th deadline. After that, the DACA program expires, and about 690,000 young people will lose their work permits and face deportation. I have a ball in these conversations with our leaders in Washington, and I continue to believe that we need to separate DACA from the larger questions of immigration reform. The solution for these people is simple. They did nothing wrong. They posed no threat to anyone. In fact, they are the kind of young people our country should be encouraging. Nearly everyone, 97%, is either in school or in the workforce. About 5% have already started their own business, and 15% have already bought their first homes.
we uh, uh, should give these young people a path to citizenship and give them all the help they need to make their own contribution to the American dream. Right now, I'm sorry to say, but I think people in both parties are using these young people as bargaining chips for their own advantage. This is nothing new uh, with the immigration debates, unfortunately. But right now, in the current negotiations, the fate of these young people is tied to very complicated questions about border wars, our national security, and the inner workings of our visa system. This is not fair, and it is not right. We need to talk about these things. Systematic reform of our immigration policy is absolutely essential to our nation's future, but it is not the right way to do it. The dreamers, as we know, have lived their whole lives in this country. Many are now in their 30s. And during their lifetimes, our leaders in Washington have not been able to fix the broken immigration system that allowed them to enter in the first place. Our system has been broken for so long. And there is too much that is broken and wrong, wrong with our system. We cannot possibly fix it in a few days with a March the 5th deadline. It just makes sense that Congress and the President should slow down and take time to debate the issues and the fashion and immigration system and, and to fashion an immigration system that really reflects the realities of the global economy. And I want to suggest two priorities or two realities that we need to keep in mind, especially as you think about these things in the context of a Catholic university. I like to describe Catholic thought as a kind of holy realism. As Catholics, we are called to deal with the world as it is, not as we want it to be or as we wish it will be. Of course, we are called to bring God's kingdom and to see God's will on earth as it is in heaven. As Catholics, that means we are always thinking about God's plan, about the world as God created it to be. But fundamentally, when we approach issues in society, as Catholics, we are dealing with reality. We are dealing with the world as it is given to us, with all its messiness and sinful, sinfulness, and with all its possibilities for redemption. How does that apply to immigration? Migration, the movement of peoples, is a reality to the global economy. A lot of migration in the world today is caused by war and natural disasters, like famines and earthquakes. That's at the heart of the TPS debate, where we can temporarily protect the protected status to Salvadorians and other refugees fleeing violence and poverty. But the migration I'm talking about is rooted in economic forces. People need to work, and the people who run businesses need workers. That's reality, isn't it? No policy in Washington is ever going to stop these economic forces. No United Nations resolution is going to make people stay in their home countries. That's, that does not mean that we throw up our hands and have open borders. Nobody is in favor of open borders. This country needs secure borders, and we need to have standards and policies for how many people we let, in, how many people we let into the country, what kind of people we let in, and how long they are allowed to stay. But the reality of global migration means that we need to do more than to fix our borders and have better security. We definitely need to do that. But we also need a modern, realistic visa system that allows workers to come and go and that provides us with the kind of workers skill and on a skill that our economy needs. 
We also need to keep this in mind. That about 10,000 baby boomers are reaching retirement age every day. So we should be uh, talking about how we increase legal immigration. At the same time, we are trying to secure our borders and prevent illegal immigration. So that's the first reality, the movements of people, the movement of peoples. The second reality we, we need to keep in mind is that every human being has a family. If we think about the, the history of our country, we have always welcomed whole families. Immigration policy has always been about families, not individuals. This has served our country beautifully. We do not want an immigration policy that only looks at people for the skills they have to offer or the economic contribution they can make. We do not want a policy that treats people like they are raw material. Or just some, some, something can be used uh, without taking into consideration the fact that they are human persons. We need to keep family unity at the heart of our immigration policy. This is also important for assimilation and especially integration. Some of the deepest problems we have in modern life, as we know, are rooted in individualism. Sociologists talk about atomization, more and more people living alone in isolation. For the good of our society, we should want to encourage family unity. Families are the backbone of communities and neighborhoods. And if we really want people to become a part of the fabric of our American life, that is much easier to do if they are together with the family. So, families. Then, uh, last point, one last point. Immigration is about people. This is obvious, but sometimes people forget. In fact, in my opinion, this is a big part of the problem in Washington and in the media. And this perspective is what we, as Catholics, bring to our national conversation. When Pope Francis spoke to Congress in 2015, he told them to remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you will have, you will have them do unto you. Sounds simple. And it is. And underneath this simple command, is a reality, that every life is sacred, that every human person is endowed with dignity by God. And a person's dignity cannot be denied or ignored just because that person does not have the proper papers. Mm. So my dear friends, as Catholics, we need to make sure our leaders remember that. What makes any society great it's not, not its military or its economy. What makes a society great is the quality of its mercy. Mm. Defending those who are weak and unprotected. Treating others as we hope to be treated ourselves. With the same love, the same compassion. Thank you for listening and I look forward to our conversation. It wasn't too long. No, it was not. Archbishop Gomez, we want to thank you for your willingness to discuss topics that are very much part of the lived experience of faculty, staff, and students at Loyola Marymount University. So thank you for being here. I serve as the chairperson of the Undocumented Students Advisory Committee, which is a committee that is um, comprised of faculty and staff across the university that are concerned about the practical everyday challenges that undocumented students face in earning their educational degree. I'm honored to be able to ask you questions and engage you in a conversation 
that will help deepen our understanding of the Catholic Church's and the Diocese of Los Angeles commitment to immigrants and specifically the DACA students who are an essential, important, contributing part of the LMU community. As you know, the Catholic Church in the United States is an immigrant church and has a long history of embracing newcomers and caring for immigrants, migrants, and people on the move. This is probably no more real than in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. The Catholic Church in Los Angeles has heeded Christ's call to welcome the stranger among us. And for this accompaniment, we encounter Christ. So I'd like to begin my question as follows. An overarching principle of all Catholic social teaching is that individuals must make economic, political, and social decisions not out of short-sighted self-interest, but with regard for the common good. This means that the moral person can not only consider what is good for his or her own self-interest, but act with the good of all people as a guiding principle. Underlying this is implication for the allocation of public resources, especially in a constrained national and state level fiscal environment in which we all live. How do we reconcile the needs with the available public resources? Um. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> um, you mean in the sense of how we, do we help the DACA? I'm, I'm talking about just in, in terms of immigration policy. Ah, okay. How do we balance what the needs are with, the, with resources, keeping in mind the principles of Catholic social teaching? Well, as I was saying, first of all, the most important thing is the dignity of the human person. Uh, independently of the uh, economic needs or realities, we have to respect the, the dignity of the human person. As, as, as I was saying, all of force created uh, uh, by God. And uh, uh, that's a, an important principle that we have to keep always. And obviously, there are the, uh, the economic uh, um, global situations that I was also mentioning. And, uh, but I think it's a, uh, 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 that's the challenge. The challenge is to find a system that helps people to move, and at the same time that is useful for the economic needs of our country. Um, I th obviously, uh, uh, what people say, you know, it will be much better if we use, you know, state money for taking care of the economic needs of people instead of building walls. You know, that's what is obvious to all of us, I think. So um, there, is, there is also the economic treaties be between countries like NAFTA. Uh, and I think uh, the challenge I think that we have is, is to put together the dignity of the human person with the reality of the economic needs of countries. So. Um, um, obviously, it's a big challenge to find a, like an ideal solution for the immigration, for the migration movements of people. But I think I think we have the the basic principle of respecting the human, the, the dignity of the human person. Then we can create a, a, a system that allows people to move right. and and facilitates. Uh, the movements of people according to the economic needs of our country. I don't know if I answered your question. You did. You did. Thank you. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about what I consider the worst case scenario, and that is that we do not um, find a legislative outcome for our DACA s students. And I'd like to engage you a little bit in a conversation about how the, arch, the diocese is planning to support individuals with DACA in the event that a form of the DREAM Act is not passed. 
and how the diocese will also and and will also support individuals who have um, TPS from Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Haiti. So maybe you can talk about the DACA issue first and and how the diocese sees their the ministry to individuals who sure. have DACA. Uh, what we have been trying to do is to make sure that uh, that we explain to all immigrants, including the DACA uh, um, kids, uh, what are their rights? Because still they have rights. Uh, even if, uh, if uh, our government is not able to address the issue by March 5th, they still have rights. So we are trying to help them and, every, every, and any other immigrant with no documents about what are their rights. We uh, started uh, workshops all over the archdiocese in all the parishes, and we, we help the immigrants, the undocumented immigrants, to know exactly what they can do. Like uh, we just printed a little uh, uh, card, and we printed more than one million cards in Spanish, um, English, uh, and Korean uh, about what are the rights of the people uh, that are immigrants, because a lot of times they don't know. Like, like uh, I give you an example. Most people think that talk about these sanctuary um, places, like thinking, oh, the parish needs to be a sanctuary place, uh, or um, LMU. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, and really, when you you look at the laws, the best sanctuary place is your own home because the, uh, the police cannot get in un unless they have uh, uh, a judge uh, warrant. So that's the best place to be. And it will be much easier for us in the, uh, in the parishes to help those people that cannot get out of their house to bring them food and everything else that they need. Instead of putting, I mean, if I try to do, make all the parishes of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles a sanctuary parish, I have at least one million people that I have to take care of. <laughs> so it's impossible for any, anybody to do that uh, because they're, gonna give, they're not gonna be there just one hour from you know, uh, uh, 11 to 12 uh, uh, attending mass. They're gonna be there for weeks or months. It would be impossible to do that. But it is possible for us to, for us to support them where they can be secure and that's their homes. Uh, that would be, I mean, I'm just, that's just one example. So what we will try con to continue doing is, is, is uh, to help them to understand their rights. Then, thanks be to God, the state of California has uh, many um, programs that is helping immigrants, inclu uh, 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 including financial help, in order that they can get the applications that they need to make for different things. Uh, um, so that's another thing that we are trying to do uh, with the state of California. And the Catholic Charities of Los Angeles is also providing the, uh, the, um, the immigrants with all the uh, legal um, uh, advice that they need in order to continue their, their you know, looking for the different possibility, possibilities that they have. There are some of the things that we are doing. If nothing happens by it, uh, March the 5th, Obviously, we have a big challenge. One possibility is that uh, President Trump extends the time of the, of the permit of that specific uh, um, uh, law. Um, another uh, then if nothing happens, I, I don't know. I'm, I suppose that we all be walking on the streets, down the streets, and trying to see what happens. But. Um, I have a lot of hope. I, 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 think, um, I think many people are working really hard to, to especially address the DACA issue, and hopefully it's gonna happen before March the 5th. We hope so too. No, I send everybody to LMU. <laughs> <laughs> so switching gears a little bit, um, the TPS program has provided sanctuary for individuals from specific countries, Nicaragua, Haiti, El Salvador, for example, um, which has been rescinded. And there are 
um, I'm, I know there are many individuals in the archdi for, in the diocese that are from those countries and have had TPS. How is the archdiocese ministering to those individuals? In, in a similar way, we are trying to educate them, like like the uh, specifically the TPS for El Salvador uh, 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 is is still valid until I think September of 2019. So, and, and there are a lot of ways in which the Salvadorians can apply for, for, for a visa outside of that program. Like if uh, a lot of them uh, are married to uh, American citizens, uh, they have children that are American citizens, so they, can, they have other options to apply for, for permits uh, to stay in, the, in, our, in, in our country. So we are trying to do that. Um, um, and obviously, we are working in Washington, trying to see if they they can facilitate these things, uh, because it's a big tragedy. I mean, these people have no place to go, and they are been here for many years. So we are still working with the uh, with the uh, with Congress and, and the White House, and trying to see something else can be done. Switching gears a little bit. Uh, I think the most important thing for me mm -hmm. is to help. Uh, uh, all of us, um, all people in the United States, to understand the issue of immigration. Mm. You know, most people think that the bishops of the United States are, are in favor of open borders or amnesty. What we, what the bishops of the United States, are, we Cal Catholics are looking for, is a, a, an immigration system that works. I, I think the best wall is a. Uh, work visa program. People come here to work. They just need a visa, <laughs> and business in this on this side can can work with the uh, uh, homeland security and have a program that people can apply and come and go. But we need to find the solution for this immigration issue. Uh, so I think it's. But I tell you, many Catholics do not understand it. It's, it's sad sometimes, but believe me, you know it. Uh, many Catholics don't understand it, so we need, to, we need to talk about it with other people and help them to understand that it's not that, that we are doing something uh, uh, that is wrong or bad for our country. As I gave you some numbers, it's good. And historically, it's been wonderful. So we just need to find the system that people can move. So I hope that you help me, uh, uh, that all of, us, all of us keep working on help on, on, on uh, helping Catholics to understand the issue of immigration. Thank you. One of the strengths that um, LMU has is it has resources and specialized expertise to be active co-workers with the Archdiocese to provide support for DACA students and their families, as well as other immigrants and refugees. In what way do you see LMU being a partner in this work? Uh, how could we assist the diocese in addressing the needs that we're talking about this evening? Well, I think, I think it would be wonderful if we can coordinate what you are doing and what we are doing. We have an Office of Immigration at the Archdiocese. Uh, that is, uh, is uh, just working on that, and they have many programs all over the archdiocese. So if we can coordinate, that will be wonderful. We have a really nice uh, web page uh, that is uh, uh, the archdiocese. Uh, uh, it's, uh, what is this, Father Brian? Nextamerica.org? It's nextamerica.org, so check it out. <laughs> so if we can coordinate, that will be wonderful. Yeah, I can ask our office because we need people. We need people that, that, that can talk to other people and help us to give the workshops, to uh, assist the people that are, they need a lawyer, they need this, they need that. So I think that will be wonderful. John, do you want to? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, 
this, this leads naturally into further reflection, I think, on the, the topic that Brian framed for us at the beginning. What is the role of the university, particularly the Catholic university in the 21st century, in helping us to engage these conversations in a way using the resources that universities distinctly have? Um, and let me just begin with, with what was Brian's very simple question of what is it that should make Catholic universities distinctive? You made some remarks in your opening statements uh, about the, the university really being there to form missionaries and disciples, true followers of, of Jesus Christ, who can then help to transform society. Can you say a little bit more about what you imagine being the distinctive characteristics of a, a contemporary Catholic university? Sure, I, uh, I think we, um, uh, we live in a, uh, in a kind of, as we know, a kind of postmodern society. And, uh, is, is very challenging out there. Um, as you probably know, um, they say that the, the religion that is growing the most is the ones that do not uh, want to join a, 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 an organized religion. Right, the nuns. The nuns. <laughs> so for a Catholic university to uh, help people to understand that faith is real, that it's not just that uh, uh, it's a, an excuse to do whatever you want mm -hmm. or to dream about things that are not real. Faith is real, <laughs> um, um, as we know. But intellectually, we need to help young people to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that will be, I think, the first thing that I will, I will imagine that a Catholic university needs to uh, make sure that the students understand that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because the reason for a Catholic university is, is as I said, you know, to help people to understand the, 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 the presence of God, and that demands faith. So um, I think that's, a, it's a, um, in my mind, I mean, it was something that we all have taken for granted that we have faith. But out there, that's not real anymore. Anyway, I think that will be the first thing that I can think of. Is there a second thing? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It doesn't have to be, but the I don't want you to miss your opportunity. <laughs> yeah, the second thing is, is uh, uh, I had a conversation with uh, Pope Francis a few years ago about the reality of the society in which we live. And we ended up talking, he, he brought it up, talking about Christian anthropology. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, who we are as a human person and who God is. So, um, but I think it starts with, with the understanding of who we are. Uh, because in the, for the new generation, in my perception, I think they don't know who they are sometimes. They think that are, are one of those uh, games that they play you know what are, what are they call um, video games? Yeah, yeah, sure. They think that they're one of those people that are in the they come and go. Right. You know, they <laughs> they really don't understand uh, who they are. Right. They understand that they have a human body and a soul and a, 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 and a heart and a mind and, and spirituality and they are things just physically with that thing. So they, they, unfortunately, if you don't understand who you are, then the pressure that people put on you because you are not, uh, your team is not the best team. You, know? mm -hmm. you are not with the, uh, with the winner of the Super Bowl. Then you are bad. You know? Who cares? I mean, no? Do you think it's so, yeah? Do you think it's possible for us at this point in time to arrest that tendency toward greater secularity and that movement away from the reality of faith as you've talked about it? Is that something that that the church, that a place like LMU, can help redirect? Or at this point in time, are we figuring out how to how to accept that as the new reality and still find ways of talking about about God, about faith, about meaning? No, I think the university has an extraordinary possibility, opportunity to, to capture the minds of the, uh, the intelligence of the young men and women that come here. Uh, uh, they are looking for that. Mm -hmm. They just never hear about it. Mm. 
you know. So I, I think it's a great opportunity to, to talk to them in that level, you know, and engage them in that conversation that they can understand simple things as, as uh, 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 um, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, uh, St. Augustine, uh, just those things that are there, um, um, basic things of humanity, I think the university is the place to talk about it. Because as you know, uh, uh, the, the young men and women that come here are totally open to what you have to say because you are supposed to be the, uh, the ones that possess wisdom, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, I think it's a great opportunity. We have our moments. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've written and you've preached uh, a great deal, certainly in, in recent months and years, about this issue of, of secularity, of of uh, sort of a shifting set yeah. of worldviews and values. And I wonder if you might want to say a little bit more about what you see as some of the, the real challenges that that push towards secular culture um, poses. But then what are also the opportunities for our own reflection um, on these realities to really um, help influence those conversations about secularity? And where can we, as representatives of the church, really engage the secular world in a way where we can, we can sort of learn from each other, share those values, and find common ground? Right. Uh, um, I think we need to accept the reality that we, need, we live in a secular world. Mm -hmm. you know, it's difficult for us in this country to, to accept that because the history of this country is a history of a Christian a Christian country. Mm -hmm. No matter what they say, the roots of this country are Christian. And it's been an extraordinary relationship between, between uh, the civil government and the church historically in this country. Yeah, discrimination and persecution and all that, nothing compared what ha has happened in other countries. You know? uh, so it's difficult for us to understand that we live, live in a secular society that, that that many people out there do not accept the, 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 the uh, understanding of uh, the human person and society as we do. That's the reality out there. You just look at some of the, the uh, reality of the legal situation that we get into. Uh, but once that we do that, understand that, then we can transform society just like the first Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first Christian live in a secular society, and then little by little they change everything. So that's I think that's what is should be the way that we can do it. How can we do that uh, in a in a in a LMU with the principles of the Jesuit spirituality and uh, and the teachings of the Catholic Church? Obviously, we are going to change the world with deeds, mm -hmm. with with taking care of the poor helping other people, uh, uh, going out to for ways, as Pope Francis is saying, to make life better for others. Mm -hmm. In that way, we can attract people, and the people can say, oh, that's a Catholic, somebody that cares about somebody else. Not just somebody who is making money or who is uh, 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 taking care of himself or uh, extraordinary intelligent person. That's wonderful. But really, when people see that the Catholic faith is, is when we serve one another. So I, I think once that we understand we live in a secular society, we need to change it you know, from the inside. And we are the, the uh, what is going to transform this society back to Christianity, mm -hmm. just like for the first Christians. Anyway, that's... That's wonderful. And you, you mentioned um, our, our, our Jesuit charism here. And, and I think for us at LMU, the, the uniqueness of our Ignatian charism provides that kind of opportunity because Ignatius was so much of the world, as we, we talked about earlier, uh, was very much about finding God in all things. And that seems to me a potential middle ground for a place like LMU to acknowledge the reality of the world, um, but to also see in it the very nature of its creation as gift from God, as the venue in which we can live out that humanity more fully. Um, and so that, that seems like a wonderful opportunity to kind of bring those things together, to really Absolutely. acknowledge secularity. So, so you don't see necessarily a tension 
between the secular and, and the faith um, that is unresolvable, but really an opportunity then to, to bring them. Yeah, I mean, the reality is that there is a, there is a tension yeah. because we are used to, uh, to be respected and, uh, uh, by, by the uh, civil society. So far, there's going to be a, you know, they say, oh, okay, we give you some, some breaks, you know, that you can practice your faith. No, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to say, no, you are a citizen of this country, you got to do like everybody else. No more exceptions. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, there is a tension. But it's a great opportunity, mm -hmm. because then uh, uh, we, 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 then we understand, hey, you know, I, I got to leave my faith. Uh, the government, I mean the government, the society is telling us, you can practice your faith at home, at church. Don't bring it to society. We don't care about that. You know? So that's going to uh, 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 kind of help us to say, hey, I, I, this is what I'm called to do, to live my faith in the middle of the world. Mm -hmm. But I got to do it in a way that, that that I can transform society from the inside. You know? It's, you know, honestly, sometimes it's very comfortable to think, okay, I have no problems, I can practice my faith. Hey, faith is more real, but you have to work on it. Yeah. And live uh, your faith in a, in a challenging uh, situation. That's, that's a great way, I think, to frame that because the challenge is that faith can be a comfortable place for many people. Um, and sometimes we don't want to be pushed out of that comfortable place, don't want to be challenged um, by, by leaders like yourself to have to think beyond I'll give you an that example. place of comfort. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, we like to talk about religious freedom. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we need religious freedom. And then many times I, talk to, I need to talk about religious freedom freedom to people from Mexico, mm -hmm. or people from Vietnam, mm -hmm. or people from Korea. Think about what religious freedom they had for centuries, none. And they are really faithful Catholics. Mm -hmm. So we in this country need to understand that unfortunately that's where we are going. Yeah. And but the call is to be faithful Catholics, independently if we are uh, respected by society or not. So. And the challenge, I mean, in those countries, you see the people from Vietnam, the people from Mexico, the people from, from, from Korea, from all of those countries, and they are really good, wonderful, faithful Catholics and make a great contribution. So that's what I think mm -hmm. we have. I mean, it's a challenge, but it's there, and it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Catholic universities in this country were largely founded in the, the 19th and early 20th centuries to really service immigrant communities in, in lots of places. Um, and as, as many of us have become more established in some ways, that ministry has shifted over time. The, the nature of the population that we served has shifted. What is the responsibility of the Catholic University in the 21st century to really rethink that prioritizing of, of uh, not only migrant and immigrant communities, but other communities, even of native-born citizens within our country who are still living on the edge and, and on the margins. Is that one of the ways that we should be distinguishing ourselves as in who we serve? Absolutely, I think the, uh, the history of Catholic schools in general in the United States is where they were started for the poor mm -hmm. and for the people in need. Uh, obviously, given the reality of uh, uh, economic society in which we live, it's not that easy. And, and the truth is that the, especially the Catholic schools and many of the universities were started for religious uh, communities, men and women. Uh, and, and the economics of that was different as it is now. Mm -hmm. But I think the, every university, every Catholic university should try to find a way to reach out to those people. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that LLU is doing that. Uh, because they they uh, uh, they are eager to uh, to to know to learn and to uh, 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 science and faith, so they are coming from a different reality, and I think they are especially uh, open to this um, beauty of Catholic education. We have some students in the audience tonight who probably should be home reading or writing papers or doing other things. Um, but they're here, and, and, and since 
you have a captive audience. What is it that you hope for our LMU students here? What, what advice do you have for them? Um, what, what opportunities should they seize while they're here in these four years or five years or six years or uh, <laughs> however long they're here? What is your hope for them, for our students? Three years? If they're transfers. Uh, <laughs> What's your hope for our students? First, they think I'd wait. <laughs> <laughs> In three years. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I, I think the uh, I, I, th I think they need to. Uh, it would be wonderful if they can really uh, uh, go deeper in the understanding of the beauty of the Catholic faith and the gift, the great gift that they have received. Uh, first, uh, from their parents, as I was saying, that I was aware of with my parents, giving me the possibility of other education. Really, I think what, uh, what uh, changes in, um, in many ways the way we are and the way we participate in society is if we, if we, um, if we educate, if we, have the, if we receive the gift of education. Um, at the end, God gave us, gave us intelligence and heart, so we need to educate our intelligence and our heart to really be uh, complete and, and uh, human persons. And in that way, they, they, we can be hum, uh, extraordinary Catholics. And, and that's what people are going to notice. Not that we are super intelligent or, um, uh, I mean, that's, if somebody is like that, wonderful. But for most of us that are kind of normal, <laughs> uh, what makes the difference is you have, you have a complete person, uh, spiritual uh, and human. So I, I, my hope is that all the students at LMU, with the help of the, uh, the uh, faculty and uh, the uh, campus ministry and everything else, they really learn the beauty of the human person that is called uh, by God to be uh, 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 totally happy and successful here on earth and then go to heaven. Is that possible for LMU? <laughs> that in some ways feels like a natural ending point. Um, I, I don't know that we're going to beat that advice at this point in time, but uh, Jeannie, is there anything else that we want to, I think we can. <laughs> Thank you. Dear. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Archbishop Gomez and Dr. Can I ask for one thing? Yes, please do. So uh, I just want to ask for your prayers. So you are in my prayers every day, and please uh, pray for me. Uh, uh, it's a, I have a big job. So. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Thanks again for, for Archbishop Gomez and for Drs. Ortiz and Sebastian. Um, thank you all for coming. We hope that, again, you'll come back to join us for, for other events and topics along these same lines. There's a reception outside, and we hope that uh, you'll, you'll all join us for further conversation before you hit the road. Thanks very much.